warm welcome to you this morning as we gather before the Lord's table. I'd like to encourage you this morning to lift up your hearts before the Lord, to forget about all the distractions of the world, and to come before the Lord's table with expectation, and the Lord will meet us in our various points of need. We'll begin this service as we sing from our common praise, 267, the blue hymn book on the pew. you kindly turn with me to page 26 of a diocesan, Diocese of Singapore service book. The Lord be with you. Together, almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, the first commandment is this, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Amen. Lord, have mercy upon us. Write all these laws in our hearts. Hear these commandments which God has given to his people and take them to heart.
God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sin, to be our advocate in heaven and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandment and to live in love and peace with all men, meekly kneeling or sitting as you are able. Shall we together say the prayer of confession? Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our fellow men in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Mighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in life eternal through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please stand. God's Collect for today, second Sunday before Lent. This can be found on the front page of our bulletin. Let us pray together the collect. Almighty God, you have created the heavens and the earth and made us in your own image. Teach us to discern your hand in all your works and your likeness in all your children. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit reigns supreme over all things, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the scripture reading. The portion of scripture appointed for the epistle is taken from the eighth chapter of the letter of Paul to the Romans, beginning to read at verse 18. This can be found on page 275 of the New Testament portion of the Bible and the Peace. Romans 8, 18 to 25, New Testament 2, 7, 5. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves 
who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. This is the word of the Lord. Praise to God. For the healing of the nations, we will stand and prayerfully sing this hymn to God and ask for his healing upon our nation, Singapore. This can be found on the hymn, Common Phrase, 427. Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel is written in the sixth chapter of the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, as recorded by St. Matthew, beginning to read from the 25th verse. Glory to Christ our Savior. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, reading from verse 25. This can be found on page 10 of the New Testament portion of the Pew Bible. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? 
And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, like one of these. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient, for the day is its own trouble. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise to Christ our Lord. May the Lord bless the reading, the preaching, and the hearing of his word. Amen. Be seated, please. Good morning, everyone. And good morning as well to those who are tuning in uh, on our live streaming of this service. Indeed, what a strange season it has been. I'm feeling like a boy once again. I'm being told a few times in a day that I need to wash my hands and do it properly and thoroughly. My temperature is being taken at every turn. So, boy, boy, do you have a fever? And as a reward for standing still, as the temperature is taken, I get a colorful cathedral sticker. And don't rub your face. Don't dig your nose. Don't scratch your ears. And yes, mark your attendance. And no, Advisory after advisory. A list of do's and don'ts. How one should behave. What meetings to attend. What to avoid. Why one should stay at home. And of course, wash your hands. Wash your hands. Wash your hands. We have all gone back to our primary school days. And there has been a panic stockpiling. One of the first things that was cleared from the shelves is toilet papers. A friend told me the other day, it is the end times and people are still worried about their ends. Actually, I've told you what every service pastor has been asked to tell the congregation, that we need to observe a good sense of social responsibility and good public hygiene. Especially the washing of hands. So, uh, can you join me in this? It's not very difficult. Uh, 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 like primary school boys, we need to, and children, we need to learn to wash our hands properly. All right? So, just follow me. That's the easiest. Just follow me. Front. Yep. Back. <laughs> forgotten now. Front, back, fingers. Fingers, knuckles. Right? Knuckles. Uh, thumbs. Nails. Wrists. Right? So, um, uh, every school boy, every school children in Singapore now is being uh, reminded of that again. Of course, as you come up later, if you be asked to wash your hands, you, you may not need to work, uh, go to step six. Uh, and seven. In fact, today, as you take communion, you realize that you don't need to touch anything <laughs> because the wafer uh, will be uh, given to you. There's a team in the cathedral, of course, in the diocese as well, who's been working very hard and almost around the crowd. And please pray and appreciate their work. And as you can imagine, I'm also receiving a thousand feedback every day. Now, please <laughs> keep them coming, even if we sound irritated at times. For it tells me that you care. 
rebuild in the cathedral, over communicate if you have to, and let you know why we are doing what we are doing. Your feedback will help us to tighten up some areas. For example, there have been some concern about the holding of the offering back when it's being passed around. We are finding now new measures to collect our offering. What you can do uh, this morning, if you have to hold the offering back, I mean, there's a way the ushers will pass you without forcing you to hold it, but if you have to hold, please take, pick up a tissue paper, right? Uh, uh, and use it to hold the handle. So there are various things uh, that you can do while we uh, step up all our measures. Mid of this week, friends and members, we are starting a cathedral radio app, uh, uh, the, the a smartphone app. We'll be doing a podcast service to complement our live streaming services so that whether alone or with your family or friends, you can worship the Lord anywhere and anytime. And with this app and through other channels, we want to over-communicate. And we'll do so daily if we have to, to keep you informed, to help guide you to pray, not just for the cathedral, but for the diocese and nation as well. We've been told to hunker down in a season, and this season may last a few months. A different way of being church. And I want to ask that we stay together as a family, even if we can't gather as one. Yes, there are many other better online offerings, better live streaming services, better sermons. By all means, listen to them, but don't ignore your own family. Uh, this is a time where we need to treasure one another, to value the work and calling of our pastors and elders, their elders. And even you can't physically be here, you're telling us that you're listening in, that you truly care about the cathedral, and then pray with her and for her. And it is good this season, in a sense, that we are reminded of how dependent we really are, even as grown-up adults, even in modern Singapore. How vulnerable we are to these infinitesimally small microbes and viruses and other forms of pestilences and dangers. Now to reflect from the epistle reading appointed for today from Romans 8. What should be the Christian response during this period? What attitudes is Paul asking us to have? And I've outlined my sermon around three words, longing, groaning, and waiting. Longing, from verses 18 to 19. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. Last Sunday, we heard this phrase, this too will pass. And this was something that Canon Rinji highlighted. This phrase, you may be surprised, is actually, actually not found in the Bible. But it is an old Persian saying. It was the president of America, Abraham Lincoln, who made this phrase famous. He used it often in his speeches, he said. It is said an Eastern monarch once, changed, once charged his wise men to invent him a sentence to be ever in view and we should be true and appropriate in all times and situations and this group of wise men presented to the monarch these words and this too shall pass away and this too shall pass away now of course this truth is so found in scripture as our sufferings are considered as only for a little while. Important point to note, whatever it may be, however painful it may put be, friends, brothers and sisters, this too will pass. A sense of acceptance of pain and suffering as the part, natural part of life is important for our resilience as human beings, of course, and as Christians. But note what Paul is saying in this passage, verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us. That this new 
is to come and the future is so far more glorious that even the act of comparison is not worth undertaking. As we will say in modern English, you cannot even begin to compare. The fact of suffering is not denied. The fact of pain is not ignored. It was the philosopher Thomas Huxley who said this, if our hearing was sufficiently acute to catch every note of pain, we would be deafened by one continuous scream. And here Paul says, the victim is the whole of creation. It is a universal experience. And he, of course, included the church as well. There will be bondage, decay and pain. But Paul is careful to say, but these are the pains of childbirth. It is, it is a pain that expects a blessing to come. It's something new is being born. The Christian is looking forward to something better. He is a longer, if there's such a word. He's longing for something. He's a longer. The Bible is not just asking us to grit our teeth and mutter, and this too will pass. He says that there is a purpose in this suffering because it's preparing us for something that is far better. Every suffering reminds us of our true destiny and it keeps us in a state of longing. It humbles us and helps us look upwards to look further into the future. It is, it is this eager longing which has given the Christian a different perspective of suffering this life. Going beyond just passive acceptance, we move into active service. We had an even song service uh, yesterday, and the lay reader made a mistake towards the end. He said, the service has now ended. And someone correctly said, Christian service is never ended. Christian service is not an event. Christian service is about serving. So we go in peace to love and serve the world. In fact, the Christian service has just begun when the event I call the service is over. Secondly, brothers and sisters, a groaning. Verse 22, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, the church, we who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. This longing has a sound. It is a sound of groaning, of sighing. And this, there in this sound of creation, and there is this sound of creation groaning together, along as well with the church. Because we are longing for something that is better. You know, a large portion, a large portion of our Bible is made out of laments. Take away the laments, the groanings, the grief, the prayerful cries of pains and longing, and your Bible is unrecognizable. Large chunks of it has been thrown away. Of course, we do not tend to commit these verses to memory. They do not belong to our favorite list of Bible verses. But they're all there in Scripture, in God's Word. God has given us permission to lament. God has given us permission to shed tears. Psalm 56 verse 8 says, You have kept calm on my tossings. You have put my tears in your bottle. You sometimes suffer a grief or a sense of bereavement whereby you're unable to sleep at night. You're tossing about. And sometimes this can last for days or sometimes even months. Many tears shed, cried until you can cry no more. I can still recall uh, my brother, uh, Clement Wong, he's a pastor as, as well, Reverend Clement Wong. Uh, the first son he had was born very sickly. 
And he was doing ministry then in another part of Malaysia when he received a call. Daddy surgeon, your boy, your child is dying. My brother told me how he has to take an emergency flight and, and, and flew back to Ipoh. You know, Ipoh is in the valley and it rains heavily, the plane cannot land immediately. And the plane was circling uh, around the skies uh, uh, of Ipoh, around the airport. And my brother said this, I cried and I cried until there were no more tears to shed. He was a nephew I've never met of whom I've never seen until one day huh, we arrived on the shores of heaven. The Bible says you have permission to shed those tears. And the Lord actually collect those tears in his bottle. Some of you have questions. Some of you uh, have questions stored up in tears. There are families who have, been, who have succumbed, families of those who have succumbed to the virus. They have many questions. Imagine those in mainland China. And the law of blaming, of course, a lot of frustration. So there is groaning in the world. And we in the church, we have permission to groan as well. Thirdly, friends, longing, groaning, and of course, praying. And all three words actually uh, saying the very same thing. Three different expressions of the same thing, praying. And I move to verse 26, eh, that was kind of left out, not uh, read to us. It says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. How, in this period of waiting, do we participate in the active redeeming purpose of God? How? Through prayerful waiting. For a groan is a prayer. A groan is meant to be heard by another. It's a cry, a call for relief, for response. So listen carefully to verse 26. The Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And so we are surprised. Yes, the world is groaning. The church is groaning. And now we hear in the words of Paul, the Spirit himself is groaning. You mean God groans? How is it that God can be in grief, you may be asking? Well, should that come to us as a surprise? Have you seen a parent grieving over a child who is in pain? Why is there grief? Because there is love. It was C.S. Lewis who said this, when the object of love is hurting, love becomes grief. So don't be surprised that God should groan with us. So this is the season, church, that one call us to prayer. We just held a very memorable even song uh, last night to commemorate the fall of Singapore. Someone asked me, it's 78 years that has passed, why now? Indeed, why now? I'm not even sure myself, but uh, about one month ago, I made a decision uh, to run uh, this even song. One of those crazy decisions. You, know, you don't have time to consult the staff or the PCC. You just feel there's something that ought uh, to be done. I didn't have time to deeply reason why it ought to be done. But it's just a move. I think it's a look back. A move of the Holy Spirit. And I know once I start, perhaps it's hard to stop. And so I had to ponder very deeply about it. It just felt that I ought uh, to put it on. Uh, those of you are not so familiar with cathedral, I have a video. I'm not sure whether you can play it. We'll try if you can. Thank you, uh, 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 PA team. 
a short interview of Bishop Leonard Wilson. And that can just give us a sense of why uh, this even song is important. But the stunned population of Singapore, psychologically totally unprepared for what was to come, was soon to feel the impact of an occupation rigorous and cruel. But for a few, there was a memorable prelude. On that Sunday evening of the day of the surrender, February the 15th, the Bishop of Singapore held a service here in St. Andrew's Cathedral in the midst of a suddenly silent city, silent after days of racketing bombardment. When the surrender came, the first place one would go to would be the uh, um, cathedral. And then I come in here and see all these wounded lying about. And so I decided to have a service of thanksgiving that the wretched war had ceased for us and to pray for the future, which was unknown and rather fearful. I noticed you used the hymn, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven which contains the words, Father like he tends and spares us. Now surely that's the very thing God hasn't done. Well, what God does, he doesn't tend and uh, care for our, our body deliberately. What it means is that he cares for us whatever the situation, his inward peace, his inward courage. And that is what we wanted to, we wanted to pray for and pray for the confidence in his guidance that would enable us to come through with honor. Amen. And this even song on the 15th of February 1943 was the beginning of the use of the cathedral as a place of prayer and worship throughout the war years. In a time of national crisis, the cathedral was used as a place of prayer and worship. And when they held the even song on that fateful evening, of course they have no idea how long Japanese occupation will be. How uh, bleak, how uncertain, of course, the future uh, will be. Of course, as we look back, we have a sense of thanksgiving. We are thankful for those who are so faithful to God in times of turmoil. They prayed, they worshipped, they loved each other, they planted the seeds that grew into the church that we have today. So, as I told the gathering at the last even song, we too, in our prayer, can plant a seed for the future. Let me say a few words about this thing called the Even Song. It's been said the Even Song is of an Anglican heritage, and in a sense it is. But the root of Even Song goes back in time to the early centuries, where Christian monks were gathered for seven times daily to pray. Now today we have this prevailing idea that monks recruit themselves from the community and, and don't do much for the community and don't do much to spread the gospel. Now, this may be true of the mon mon early centuries, second, third, fourth centuries, the, the, the monastic movement in northern Africa, Africa, Egypt, and so, so forth. Given the environment they were in, uh, uh, highly, I wouldn't need to mention in detail, it was a hostile environment. But the mon monastic movement that grew in Ireland and the British Isles a little later, were very different. The monks were missionaries, the monasteries were bases for missions. Governed by the Benedictine rule, prayer and holiness resulted in the evangelization of that part of the world. It was much later, Thomas Cranmer, in the 16th century, who distilled these monastic practices of daily prayer for ordinary Christian folks like me and you. Reducing the seven Benedictine liturgy of the hours into two matins, all morning prayer and even song. Morning prayer and evening prayer. That the church may continue to be in daily prayer. The church indeed is the monastery of daily prayer. That as the day ends, as we enter into the uncertainties of another night, we're able to pray. Lighten our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord, and by thy great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of thy only Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And friends, we've been told we're entering into another long night. A time for less activities. A time for less events. 
you check any Facebook church, Facebook site, you find this and that is now cancelled. But more prayer, perhaps, in smaller groups or in families or personal prayer. More spiritual retreats. Ironically, we've been told recently by health ministry, more services <laughs> to avoid overcrowding. And now in the cathedral, we have tried to figure out how to create space and time for more services. I want to ask, can the cathedral, the wider church in Singapore, be more monastic and learn to hibernate in prayer during this season? And in so doing, discover our roots again, as a praying church. Not just an active serving church, but a church that learns to be quiet in prayer. During the bubonic plague in 560 AD, Pope Gregory the Great called for public procession of Christians. And they keep chanting this word, Kyrie Eliason, Lord, have mercy on us. I'm not asking whether we should do that. But will we search our hearts? It's not a time to speculate why is God judging us. But it's a time to search our hearts. Is there duplicity, complacency? Is there a casual attitude towards sin, unkindness, unlove towards our neighbour? As I said early on, the cathedral will come up with tools to help us be engaged in daily prayer. Can this be the beginning of a prayer revival in the church to return to our monastic roots? This year has been proclaimed as a year of personal discipleship. And friends, I believe this crisis can be an opportunity for us to learn to follow Christ. Longing, longing groaning, praying. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank God for the words we've heard and the encouragement from the canon. Shall we stand? and affirm our faith through the words of the Nicene Creed on page 32 of our prayer books. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is sin and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He became incarnate of the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please sit or kneel as we go into a time of intercession. Brothers and sisters in Christ, let us pray for the church and for the world and let us thank God for his goodness. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, you promised through your Son, Jesus Christ, to hear us when we pray in faith. This morning, as we listen to your word, we are grateful for the reminder that during this strange season, you remain Lord of all, and you remain in control. Indeed, Lord, in the midst of this difficult time, we long even more of your reign. 
And even as we groan, we know you groan with us. But our eyes are lifted up, our heads too, towards heaven, knowingly waiting and praying that till that, come, that time should come, you will always be our keeper, our shade, and you'll keep our coming and going. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O God, the creator and preserver of all mankind, we pray for men of every race and in every kind of need. Father, we pray that your ways are made known on earth and your saving power among all nations. Remember today the needs of your creation, us, the human race. Father, we know you hear our cries. Each day we continue to be saddened when we hear the daily updates on the COVID-19 situation in Singapore and around the world, especially in China. We pray for the nations of the world, that nations will come together to strengthen their unity and collaboration as they seek to prevent the further spread of the coronavirus and find a cure. We pray for your protection upon all healthcare workers, especially those in China, that you will grant them supernatural, physical, mental and emotional strength to care for the overwhelming number of infected people. Lord, for the infected, restore them back to good health. But most of all, we pray that through this crisis, there will be a spiritual awakening in China and around the world, and multitudes will turn to Christ as they recognize their need for salvation and your mighty deliverance from this pestilence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For Singapore, our beloved nation, we pray for your protection over us. We pray for social cohesion and psychological resilience, even as we face an increasing spread of COVID-19. As your church, we commit to looking out for each other and caring for the needs of others, especially the vulnerable, as well as the frontline and healthcare workers. We pray against xenophobia, the circulation of fake news, panic stockpiling of food and other divisive action that will create greater problems for our nation. And we will lead by example. And this morning, we remember the pastors and members, especially of the three churches affected by the news of the confirmed cases. Life Church and Mission Singapore, Paya Labor Methodist Church, and the latest being Grace Assembly of God Church. We ask for your peace and your presence to be strongly felt. May the church in Singapore arise in faith and shine for Christ during this period of crisis, and that we will sense the urgency of the times to share the gospel with those who have yet to know you. Jesus, with you in our vessel, we have no fear, and we can certainly smile at any storm. We will remain calm and face this crisis together. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our diocese, Lord, thank you for guiding the election process and for the appointment of Varun Canon Dr. Titus Chung as our bishop designate with effect from 4 February. We pray for him and his family as he prepares himself to serve in this new role. May the handing over of responsibilities from Bishop Venis, who has been an exemplary shepherd leader for our diocese, to our Bishop Dexinet be a smooth one. May our anointing and empowering be upon Canon Titus to lead our diocese with courage and faith when his term of office begins. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray also for St. John's and Margaret's Church, the continual equipping of volunteers in the various service in anticipation of the launch of SJSM Nursing Home. May the Kampong gathering on the 29th of February be a season and a session that will inspire volunteers to make a difference in this new vineyard. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For St. Andrew's Cathedral, even as we have prayed for other churches, we pray for our own cathedral leadership to be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding as they lead SAC through this global health crisis. We pray that the cathedral will be strengthened in faith, be strong in our worship, courageous in our service, and powerful in our witness as we remain faithful to God's call and our destiny as a church in the city. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Strengthen our bishop and all your church in the service of Christ, 
that those who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Bless and guide Madam Halima Yaakob, our president, Mr. Lee Sien Long, our prime minister, and all our cabinet ministers. Give strength to them, O Lord, and give wisdom to all in authority. Direct this in every nation, the ways of justice and of peace, that men may honour one another and seek the common good. We pray for all our leaders, both in church and in our country, that you continue to bless them with good health and your abiding presence in all they do and say. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And together we pray, merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Pamela, for leading us in a time of corporate intercession. At this time, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to everyone who's visiting us for the very first time. May I please ask you to wave your hand as the wardens have a brochure to pass it to you. Anyone? First time? Thank you. If you'd like to know more about the cathedral, please proceed to the welcome desk after the service. Also, welcome those who uh, have logged in to our live stream too. So, thank you. At this um, time, I'd also invite the Reverend Canon Terry to give us a special announcement from the vicar's desk. Well, uh, uh, I couldn't find it in the bulletin actually, uh, but. By now, you have received the uh, wonderful news uh, through the bishop election process. We have now, as of 4th of February, we have appointed a bishop designate uh, in the person of Reverend Canon Haifis Chung, no stranger to us because he's also the priest in charge of our Chinese congregation. So please keep him, his wife Connie, and, and his uh, children in prayer as we prepare uh, to serve the Lord in a, in a different way uh, when he is finally appointed. Uh, as uh, Bishop of Singapore, uh, sometime on the eight, actually on the 18th of October this year. So keep, please keep his family in prayer. Back to you. Very much. Now allow me to reiterate just a few things. In this season of coronarization, we will be passing a contactless peace uh, with a wonderful smile. We will cheer one another in that regard. May I also kindly remind you that we will be practicing only one form of receiving the elements today, and that is going to be by intinction by the priest. So you will not need to be doing anything as Canon Terry announced. You will just come with your palm and we will drop uh, both the body and blood of Christ. So it will be the body and blood of Christ given for you. Lastly, um, when coming to the Lord's table, please come by faith. Come with faith in your hearts that this too will pass away and God is still on the throne. So may I invite you to please stand. We are the body of Christ. In the one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. Let us then pursue all that makes for peace and builds up our common life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Please offer one another a contactless sign of the peace. Our offertory hymn is taken from Common Praise 376, And Can It Be?
Shall we together say the prayer of thanksgiving on page 36? Yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the splendor, and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. All things come from you, and of your own do we give you. The Lord is here. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right. It is our duty and our joy at all times and in all places to give you thanks and praise. Holy Father, Heavenly King, Almighty and Eternal God, through Jesus Christ, your only Son, our Lord, for he is your living word. Through him you have created all things from the beginning and formed us in your own image. Through him you have freed us from the slavery of sin, giving him to be born as man and to die upon the cross. You raised him from the dead and exalted him to your right hand on high. Through him you have sent upon us your holy and life-giving spirit and made us a people for your own possession. And therefore with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name forever praising you and saying, sit or kneel. Accept our praise as Heavenly Father through your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, and as we follow his example and obey his command, grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us his body and his blood, who in the same night that he was betrayed took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, Heavenly Father, we remember his offering of himself made once for all upon the cross and proclaim his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension as we look for his coming in glory. We celebrate with this bread and this cup, his one perfect sacrifice. Accept through him our great high priest, this our sacrifice of thanks and praise. And as we eat and drink these holy gifts in the presence of your divine majesty, renew us by your spirit. Inspire us with your love and unite us in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through him and with him and in him, by the power of the Holy Spirit, with all who stand before you in earth and heaven, we worship you, Father Almighty, in songs of everlasting praise. As our Savior taught us, so we pray and say.
we break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Pray of humble access together. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies, we are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to eat his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Draw near with faith, receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ which he gave for you and his blood which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Father, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your son and brother's home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit light give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, so we and all your children shall be free and the whole earth live to praise your name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Together, Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. And now in the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge of God and of his Son, Christ Jesus our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit remain and abide with you and all that is yours, both now and forevermore. Amen. So people of God, go in peace to love and to serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. Our recessional hymn is taken from Common Praise 530. Now thank we all our God. 